First of all, thank you, Council President Felicia Moore, for joining us today. We know it's been a busy, busy uh, few weeks, months for you. So we're going to start with crime. And the first question is, in our, mo in our most recent Survey USA 11 Alive poll, 71% of voters say crime in the city will be a major factor in how they vote. How much of the surging crime rate do you believe is pandemic related? Well, I believe the pandemic certainly plays a role in everything that's happening, but I don't think that it's the only issue. Mm -hmm. You know, we have in this city some generational poverty issues that we haven't addressed. I believe that that is a large part of it. So that's why my five C's crime plan first focuses on our children. Many of the crimes are being conducted by kids that are 12 to 24 years old, focusing on mentoring, getting them youth employment. They don't like to do arts and crafts. They want to make money and then enriching their lives with exposing them to other activities. Because I believe when kids do things that uh, keep their attention, they don't do other things. And it also focuses on the family. We have to remember that. You know, the single mother, I want to work with our workforce development agency and even partner with our unions to get them into jobs that are above living wage, above that $15 an hour, and then help them into home ownership mm -hmm. so we can start to break that cycle of generational poverty. So we have that as, I believe, a part of what's going on and just general sense across the country. You know, people are committing a lot of violent crimes. They are. Your opponent has accused you of not having a plan to tackle crime right now. What can residents expect to see in the first 100 days when it comes to restoring public safety? Well, he's incorrect, uh, and I do have a plan for right now. And I had a 100-day plan, which is on my website. But the first thing I will be doing is looking at the leadership of the department, getting new leadership as an interim chief, and then doing a national search for a permanent chief. I will be getting, uh, within that first 100 days, the equivalent of 200 more officers on our street. And I say equivalent because I'm going to take those officers. So not just in a year but in the first 100 days. In the days. first 100 days. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take those officers that are behind the desk with guns mm -hmm. and have them to spend at least eight hours of their 40 hour work week on the street but backing up our patrol officers. I'm also gonna incentivize those officers who have recently left and ask them please come back on a contract for a year or two so we can help pull our force up and our numbers. And that will be an incentive because they are retired. You can keep your retirement pay. We'll also pay you uh, to come and that can help uh, alleviate you know, the, the shortage that we're having. And then I'm also gonna have 24 hour, seven day a week mental health responders on our streets. That will also take some of the pressure off our officers. They won't be armed. Uh, they will be trained medical professionals that can take some of that pressure off of our officers. And I believe that that is an immediate response to getting more presence on the street. That covers the now. Can we talk about the police chief, what your plans are for Chief Bryant? So you just said that you plan to bring in a new police chief. Mm -hmm. You have said that the current chief, Chief Bryant, does not share your vision. He doesn't line up with your vision for the city. So what are you seeing in the current chief and within the Atlanta Police Department that would line up with your vision? So what specifically are yeah, you looking for? Yeah, so I don't for? remember saying that he doesn't share my vision. We haven't had a vision conversation, mm -hmm. but I just believe that we need new leadership so that we can start in a new direction. And I want whomever that chief to be is one that shares my vision. And my vision is number one, that they keep our city safe and make it safer. But secondly, and this is an important piece because we have to deal with the reform issue. Police officers alone is not the issue. We have to make sure that we're doing everything we can to make sure when our citizens interact with our officers mm -hmm. that they feel safe in their interactions with them. And they've got to share that vision as well to do both. Self-defense and vigilantism have surged back to the forefront of this national conversation around race for weeks now. Both are at the core of the cases involving Kyle Rittenhouse and Ahmaud Arbery. As mayor, how would you lead the city and address this tough conversation with police and residents? Well, and it's not, you know, vigilantism is not a police issue per se, because, you know, even going back to Trayvon Martin, there were average citizens who took it upon themselves to, uh, to administer uh, 
what is it, law enforcement. Uh, and we definitely in this state have addressed it when we have eliminated the citizen's arrest law. And I would certainly... So how would you address this with residents then? Well, that, well, because that's what I'm Kyle saying. Rittenhouse and Ahmaud Arbery, yes, yes are, so are not I'm, involving police, but right, what it is I'm an saying, issue that every city has to tackle right mm -hmm. now and the mayors have to address in some Most way. Most definitely. And so as I address it as mayor to say that we do not condone that behavior and we would ask that citizens not do it. And if we're doing our job with our police and our law enforcement, people shouldn't feel a need to have to take on that role themselves. And that's what I'm going to do is make this city safe so that people don't feel that they have to arm themselves or they have to become the police force in the community mm -hmm. because we have people that are trained professionals to do it. Okay. What is the most frustrating part of the city's affordable housing shortage issue for you? The most frustrating part is people that I know who want to live in this city who can't live here because they cannot afford it. And I hear their stories of where they've tried and it's really, it's really frustrating, mm -hmm. particularly our city employees. I had one employee tell me, for instance, you know, she's on call. And so at any time she may get a call and have to come into the city and she has to drive 40, 50 minutes to get into the city because she can't live here. She can't afford to live here. So that's a very frustrating thing. Yeah. We have college residents who went to school here and, and can't live here, mm -hmm. police officers, middle income families can't live here, everybody's being forced out to the burbs. The socioeconomic divide is just growing and growing and growing. You have spent 20 years as a city council member, almost four years as city council president. In all of that time, what have you done to build or create more affordable housing in the city? So I have been working on this issue before it was an issue. I remember when we were doing the Beltline, I was very concerned about the speculation of property and the increase in that property and fought very hard. And successfully, we amended our Beltline to make sure that we had an affordable housing trust fund. Unfortunately, it didn't get utilized the way that I would have liked to see it and certainly have spoke out against that. But in my district, District 9, that was what I was about. Every development that was built in my district had to have an affordable component or they had problems for me, the council member. That started with Perry Homes when it was redeveloped to West Highlands. We have affordable senior facilities, affordable apartments, and a big model, which was a big fight, but we were able to accomplish it affordable single family homes in that development. Mm -hmm. And then I've also uh, helped build out at least two or three other senior facilities that are really affordably priced for our seniors because many of them, when they get to a point of wanting to leave their homes, they're having a difficult time finding affordable units. And so yeah. everything we've done, even the public shopping center, uh, which I'm so proud of that we were able to fill that food desert, the housing component we made sure that at least 20% of it was affordable and actually even more is affordable. Does it almost seem like a flood sometimes? You make a dent and the problem just keeps getting bigger and bigger? Exactly. So when you, when you build development in the city and you uplift the community by, for instance, putting in a grocery store, or putting in shopping, it sort of has a halo effect that increases the value of property around it and people who want to live there. And then people who sell property see, hmm, well, if I have a house that's 200000 I can maybe build one that's four. And so the assessed value of property is really important to look at. And people don't realize that 56 cents of every dollar goes to the school board, 23 approximately to the city, and the other to the county. Mm -hmm. So I want to work with our other taxing jurisdictions to see if for our legacy residents who've maybe lived in their homes for 15 years or more, that we can freeze that assessment until they sell that property. That's one way we can help legacy residents stay in their homes. What other things will you do differently as mayor when it comes to affordable housing? We're talking about legacy residents. What other initiatives will so, people, can people look forward to? Yeah, so I want to flip the script on incentives that we've given out. Mm -hmm. Typically people say, hey, I'm going to build this. I'll give you a few affordable units, you give me the incentive. I want to flip it and say, we want X amount of affordable units, we want it here, because we have a lot of city-owned property, we have a lot of land bank authority property, we have a lot of AHA property, and if you build what we ask, then we'll give you the incentive. 
I think that's how we have to try to get people to, particularly the private sector, to be able to build. And then we've got to allow them to have the permitting that they need mm -hmm. uh, and do it in a timely manner so they don't have to pass high burdens of waiting for permits onto the, the residents. Yeah. I spoke to a resident yesterday who pointed out that over the years they've heard many promises about how that vacant land will be used and it's a blight in their neighborhoods and it's just been years and years of promises. How can the residents be assured that you're going to be the mayor to make that happen? Well, people can look at my track record. I don't say things that I don't do. And if I find I can't do them, they know I will come back to them and let them know. I'm a person of my word. That's why I'm running for mayor, essentially, is we have a long list of things that we said that we we're going to do and we just haven't gotten to them. Mm -hmm. And I want to get things done. And so they should uh, rest assured, uh, knowing my track record, that I, I will do what I say. It's a big list. It is a long list. And as I say, many hands make light work. All of this is not going to be done by this single individual alone. We're going to work and partner with any and everyone that we can. I'm looking forward to partnering with NACA, which is a housing advocacy group. We also help with financing, help to build capacity for people to own homes, and I'm proud to have their endorsement. I'm looking to bring our private sector, our philanthropic, our university, everybody to the table because we got so many issues that uh, we all got to work on them together. Yeah, got to roll up your sleeves big That's time. That's right. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for Council having me. Council President Moore.